sometimes you just have to think and there's just nobody that's ever going to do it for you. And that's part of like being a human being is that there's certain things you're going to have to use your, your own mind and not anyone else's mind to figure out. That's why I think the good framing of philosophy is what would you do with leisure? <laughs> what, what could possibly be worthy of the use of your leisure time? And I haven't really found anything else. Like even high art for me doesn't really come close to being something where I would say I could do it for eternity in leisure. What conceptual literacy should give you is a sense that you're not going through life on autopilot, being kind of commandeered by your basic biological needs, your health. It's one number two is other people. So it's conformity, belonging to a group, status, etc. People often think of themselves as free thinkers and as rebels because they ignore one of the commands, but then they're just ever more slavishly responsive to the other. Sincerity is like the only tool we have when it comes to those things. When there's questions you actually want to know the answers to. There's just nothing else at your disposal but sincerity. Agnes Callard is a philosopher and essayist who specializes in ancient philosophy, ethics, and Socratic communication. Her work has won the 2020 Leibowitz Prize, for philosophical achievement and is centered around how humans can become better. She and economist Robin Hansen also co-host a podcast called Minds Almost Meeting. In this conversation, we discuss Agnes's views on disagreement and progress, her inclination to question and operate outside of accepted societal structures, the role of self-reflection, relationships, and more. Agnes, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Agnes, we, we met on Twitter maybe four or five years ago when I asked philosophy Twitter, what progress has the field of philosophy made over the past century? And what progress will philosophy uh, make over the next century? And, and your, your answer, if I remember correctly, was that uh, philosophy identified a, a bottom and, and maybe a top, but it has yet to identify how to reconcile. The, I'll, I'll let you uh, edit that characterization because I'm sure, sure it could be better. How, how to reconcile sort of egalitarianism and, and meritocracy. We'll get to that. But first, I want to identify that someone responded, uh, citing this paper that I believe David Chalmers wrote, where he surveyed his colleagues and um, asked his colleagues why there hasn't been as much progress in the field of philosophy as, as they might have liked. Some answers were that they were, you know, the low hanging fruit had been picked. And so it was harder to have new discoveries, as some people have you know, said that that happens in other fields. And other people said there were more structural issues with, with the academy. Et cetera. So I'm curious if you would agree with that claim that, you know, progress has slowed down to some degree. And if so, uh, why is that the case? Yeah. So, well, progress has slowed down. Is the implication that it was once going faster <laughs> and now it's going slower? Or um, like, I, I think it was never going very fast. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, there are a lot more philosophers now than there used to be. So maybe you would expect it to have sped up. And I guess I don't have the sense that it has. It's really hard to think about what does progress in philosophy mean? And one reason why it's hard to think about that is that, you know, as you were talking about philosophy, I was thinking about combs. I have a comb right here. And I was like, has there been progress in combs? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, this looks like a pretty old design. It's my comb, but it works well. Um, and uh, maybe there, there hasn't been so much progress in combs, but maybe, maybe we're done with, we, maybe we did it. You know, it's not the case that we always want progress in everything. Right. And, uh, the thing about philosophy is that it's an attempt to answer certain questions that show up in your life where other people can't do it for you. So I can't get your philosophizing done for you in a way that I can get other things done for you. And when there's something that I can get done for you, then maybe I could get it done quicker as opposed to slower. But when you have to do it for yourself, it's just less obvious that there's so much of a question of how quickly uh, is it being done. And I almost feel like the kind of obsession with the question of philosophy, is, of, of progress in philosophy, but especially by the world outside of philosophy is a kind of uh, unwillingness to reckon with this fact um, that we're, we're never going to get it done for you, no matter how fast we do it, no matter how good we get at it, 
it's going to be totally irrelevant to the rest of you guys unless you do philosophy. And that the, that the subtext of the question is like, what, like, when will it be over? <laughs> you know, when will my work, my philosophical work be completed by these other people? Uh, and the answer is just never. You're an academic philosopher, but you're also a public philosopher. And um, you have kind of explored the tensions of what that means to be a public philosopher. Is it, is it good work to do, um, you know, philosophy in public? You've also explored um, or written about how, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's a shame that academic philosophy is so impenetrable or, or you know, so um, structured in a certain way that appeals to a very small demographic because it's so good. Why don't you reflect on sort of the, the tensions that you've explored? The main difference between academic and public philosophy is like how much familiarity and buy-in to the questions you can presuppose in your audience. If I tell an academic philosopher, I think I've got a solution to Moore's paradox, which in fact, I think I do. The philosopher will be like, whoa, okay, what is it? All right. If I tell that to like somebody who's not in philosophy, they'll be like, what is Moore's paradox? And then even when I tell them what it is, they'll be like, why should I care? <laughs> yeah. I just take a lot of joy in speaking to that second kind of audience, the audience that demands to know why should I care? Because I think it's a it's a kind of perpetual danger in philosophy that we lose hold of that question um, and that we, in fact, start to treat philosophy as something that we're doing on behalf of other people um, rather than on behalf of ourselves. Uh, so I see it as a personal benefit to myself. I think it's kind of inevitable if a small group of people keeps talking only to each other that they're going to talk in ways that are a bit impenetrable to people on the outside you know, the more competitive it gets to join that group of people and the more number of years of study it takes, that the wall is going to get higher and higher. And my simplest answer to what I like about public philosophy is that like when it comes to the stuff I produce, like say a podcast or if I write something, that stuff, people want to consume it. Um, whereas when I produce academic philosophy, nobody wants to consume it. So you're producing something that nobody wants to read. Uh, as an academic philosopher, that's very depressing, I find. Some people will read it, like, for instance, as a favor to give you comments on it before publication or because they need to read it for their to write their paper or something. But that being embedded in that system, it's really demoralizing. It has very bad effects on people. So the people are very interesting. They're some of my favorite people to talk to. But I hate writing for them because when I'm writing for them, I'm basically writing for an audience that doesn't want to read the things I'm writing. We did an interview a few years ago on Clubhouse with Mark Andreessen. And in helping us prep for the interview, he said that you, you had an exchange once around, or one question that you were curious about was whether philosophy makes the world a better place. Can you uh, un unpack your, your exploration uh, I into that massive question? Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't have any memory of this, but I trust you. I think it's it's hard to answer that question as though it weren't already a philosophical question, which it is, right? Um, and so it presupposes the value of the activity that it also calls into question. So that's a kind of odd structure to the question. There's a, almost a sense of, it's not self-undermining, but it pretends to be more open than it is. It's like, oh, does philosophy make the world a better place or not? I'm open to either answer, but I'm going to engage in the activity as though it were of some value, right? So I, I, I see that tension there a bit. That said, so that's, that's to say, take everything I say with a grain of salt, because I haven't, I'm not really, I can't be approaching it as openly as I might pretend to be. But uh, yeah, I think it definitely does. <laughs> that's why I do it. So I mean, I can say more about why, but. Well, I guess another, another version of that is, if philosophy is the love of wisdom, and we certainly need wisdom in all sorts of decisions in our life, why aren't we consulting philosophers? And it, 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 why do we, who do we consult ahead of philosophers, therapists, religious, you know, people, of other kinds of academics, coaches, leaders of other types? Like, it feels like if, if philosophers have the deepest understanding of wisdom, it feels like they aren't getting the credit or the uh, aren't putting to the test. It, it feels largely academic, which is to say divorced from practice. I don't know. If, is that a fair characterization? And if so, why? I think that people do consult philosophers somewhat. So people consult me about a variety of things, but in consulting me, they might become frustrated because consulting a philosopher is a little bit like consulting a therapist where they don't give you answers. And that's because 
philosophers understand this thing that I said at the beginning, which is that we can't do your philosophizing for you. That is, there are certain kinds of thinking you just can't outsource. And so you're asking me, well, these supposedly wise philosophers, why aren't we outsourcing our thinking to them? And it's like, well, because we found the kind of thinking that you can't do that with. Sometimes you just have to think. And there's just nobody that's ever going to do it for you. And that's part of like being a human being is that there's certain things you're going to have to use your, your own mind and not anyone else's mind to figure out. And I think philosophers can help you do that if you want to do it, but a lot of people don't want to do it. And so then they don't do it. Um, and I don't think philosophers feel slighted by that. In fact, it's interesting. I think like, say, economists are often consulted, right? For, um, but they're often not consulted and they they feel as a group, I think, slighted in the sense that we should be consulted more than we should be more important than we are. Something like that. Philosophers, I think, don't feel that at all. They couldn't care less whether you care about us. <laughs> um, I, I might be slightly an exception to that. That is, I'm someone who somewhat cares what the like outer world thinks of me. But but most philosophers are just like totally happy for you for the rest of you to just completely ignore us because we like found the best thing. And if you don't want to share it, that's your problem. I, I, I certainly don't doubt that you're consulted a number of things, but I, I understand you as do you one of the most foremost uh, philosophers, you know, um, around. And I think um, so I understand for things like, uh, hey, you need to know what is the interest rate going to be. You go to you, you need an answer. You go to an economist who gives the answer. But it feels like with therapy, you go to a therapist to help you. Under, do some work too, at, just as you described philosophy. So why don't we go to philosophers instead of therapists? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a very small um, group of philosopher therapists. It's like a thing. Um, I have never gone to one nor served as one, so I don't know much about it. I think that maybe we philosophers are not great at making ourselves universally open to conversation. Like we are open to certain kinds of conversation in certain sorts of contexts. Lots of people have had some experience of a philosopher because lots of people go to college and when they're in college, like there's a good chance they'll take a philosophy class at some point. Like when I'm, you know, in an Uber or whatever, I often talk to someone and they'll be like, oh, I took one philosophy class. It's, that's, it's common, right? So which is to say philosophers have made ourselves available. We've made ourselves available to teach people in college, but we haven't, we haven't really made ourselves available in a kind of broader way. And you know, I, sometimes I think of it like the invention of writing, right? So I don't really know the history here, but like writing is something where it took a while for it to take off. So like literacy, I mean, both reading and writing, right? So like in the ancient world, you know, that I study, like not, you couldn't take it for granted that someone would be literate, that someone would be taught to read, that they would be able to read and write. And you might've asked, why didn't they, why didn't like literacy just immediately spread? Um, why didn't everyone avail themselves of this great thing? You know, you see someone like Socrates, who's like, I, I'm very skeptical of this newfangled thing, literacy writing, you know, it's going to mess up people's memories. It took a really long time. Like it kind of took thousands of years for it to become near universal. It's not even universal today, but near universal. And I think philosophers have a thing that's like, like that it's like conceptual literacy it's being able to take the very terms in which you understand yourself and understand them and break them apart and rearrange them and that's incredibly valuable it's sort of like your yourself becomes kind of an open book and why wouldn't anyone want that well for kind of the reasons that not everyone wanted literacy at first which is that it's not obvious how good it is until you have it i think and the other part I have to say is that it's also maybe not so obvious how good it is when not everyone has it and it's not really obvious how to deploy it in human interaction. And so, you know, the the history of like the past, let's say, one or 200 years of philosophy has been like real serious doubts about philosophy. Wittgenstein's probably the most important, you know, philosopher of uh, you know, the re re recent philosopher, and he is somebody who seemed to see philosophy as largely existing to cure our desire for philosophy. Um, that's contentious, and some people will disagree with me about that as a, as a matter of interpreting Wittgenstein. But so there's this question, if you could have this skill, if you could have this ability of deconstructing the way that you think, 
and seeing inside of it and seeing where the problems were, would that even be good for you? I think it is, but not everyone who has it even thinks it is. Just as you might doubt, as Socrates, Socrates was literate, um, but he doubted the value of literacy. So you can, so there's the question, you know, could you appreciate the value of it if you didn't have it? And then even if you did have it, can you appreciate the value that it really only would have in a world where more people had it? That's fascinating. So you're saying it might not be as valuable in a world where only a few people have it, but it becomes more, there's network effects. <laughs> hey. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey, everybody. If you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll want to know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your business needs. Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offered today. NetSuite is number one because they give you your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with my promo code at netsuite.com slash upstream. That's netsuite.com slash upstream to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm. netsuite.com slash upstream. I mean, going deeper as to why it makes the world a better place, I'm curious, like, curious let's, let's unpack that on kind of like a individual level and societal level. So, you know, people need to spend time and money to undergo philosophy. You know, the state subsidizes it somewhat. And so it needs to have some sense of ROI on that relative to other things. At the same time, I've heard you talk about and other people talk about how, how it's valuable for its own sake, but we often need to justify, you know, there's opportunity cost to everything. And so why don't you make the, make the case a little bit or, or un unpack that further? So I think that philosophy is the best answer that we have come up with to the question, what could the serious use of leisure be? Say, you know, we want progress and we want to be spending our time and money well. The reason we want that is to free ourselves from want and to free ourselves from the need to struggle and work, or at least to make it a little bit easier. Um, that is to have not every ounce of our energy be occupied by the need to survive and help other people survive. And so suppose we relieve ourselves from that for some stretch of time, every day or something. Suppose we relieve ourselves for an hour or for three hours or maybe for the whole day in a really ideal world. And then the question will be, what, what are we going to do with that time that we have, where we have relieved ourselves from cares and I think the contenders are going to be basically forms of entertainment. Um, and they may be very high class entertainment like art or something. And then um, forms of thought and inquiry and understanding. And uh, we better have something to fulfill that slot or we really don't have much of a reason to be trying to make a better world. There, there's a scene in the book Moneyball written by Michael Lewis have you, are you familiar with the book? Yes. Okay. Um, well, for the audience, the, the, the book is about how the Oakland A's um, had this, you know, new mathematical way of evaluating talent and, and, you know, doing baseball strategy that was, you know, far superior to the, to the one that preceded it. And um, these analysts on the Oakland A's have these, you know, analytical superpower. And they're wondering if they should tell one of their players about it. And the coach says, no, because it'll confuse them. Uh, like if he, if he, the more he learns, it might shake, shake him up a little bit. And so I'm curious as to when the idea of like, when increased self-knowledge is helpful and, and when it isn't, there's another example you've brought up in the past or you've written about, which is the idea of like, um, status games where we have these kind of indirect ways of communicating status. And this is my projection. Sometimes like the more you are conscious of status, it might confuse you in a way because you actually can't be direct about it. Yeah, sometimes the, the the more you know ain't so. I, I forget what the phrase is, but you, you get what I'm saying. How, how do you think about that? Or what what comes to your mind when I bring up the Oakland A's example or otherwise? 
Yeah, I mean, I I do think that when you're trying to understand some activity that you're engaging in, and there's a kind of reflexive or natural way that you engage in the activity that could be disrupted by giving attention to it. I think that's true. That's a real phenomenon. And I often use that effect actually like in the classroom, you know, um, I will, if I'm discussing, I don't know, recently I was giving a lecture about, and I, and I wanted to talk about sort of various kinds of conformity. And I'm like, well, notice what you're wearing and that you look similar to everyone else in this room. Notice that you have certain expressions on your face. They're like lecture listening expressions. Uh, I, I, I pointed out uh, so somebody had um, uh, given the example of like scoring points in some way and I pointed out, well, he was asking his second question. So I'm like, look, you asked your second. The first one was what you had to do in order to score points. But now the second one, you know, that's just for free. Um, so you probably wanted to know something. So anyway, there's, there's certain things where I would like call attention to what's to the person's peculiar condition. And it's dis a bit disruptive for exactly this reason, because there was a naturalness that they had sitting in the classroom, raising their hand, asking a question that is no longer there. And then the question is, when is that worth it? <laughs> it's, it's going to be worth it when your desire to understand something is going to be stronger than your desire that it get performed one way or the other, regardless of whether that performance is itself based on a misunderstanding right? So sometimes you're like, look, I just need this to happen. I just need it to go through, even if it's founded on some illusions, because I like, I just need to get through the next 15 minutes. And I, I think that's a lot of life. A lot of people for life is just, I just need to get through the next 15 minutes. And philosophy gets in the way of that. It throws a wrench in the getting through the next 15 minutes. But the philosopher's perspective is like, eternal, right? So it's just that what you wanted to do in the next 15 minutes probably isn't that important. It's probably okay to throw a wrench in it. And whether or not you win a baseball game or whether or not you feel comfortable in a classroom, like it's not that important compared to eternity. And so it's really, that's why I think the good framing of philosophy is what would you do with leisure? <laughs> what, what could possibly be worthy of the use of your leisure time? And I haven't really found anything else, like even high art for me, doesn't really come close to being something where I would say I could, I could do it for eternity in leisure. Like I would say, ah, I wouldn't want to read that many novels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do like the eternity perspective. Donald Hoffman has a book called the case against reality. One example where he, he's basically trying to show that we're not evolved to seek truth first, or we're only evolved to seek truth when it helps us. And one example um, that, resonates with some people who play basketball or sports is when the ball is is out of bounds and it's unclear who who knocked it out of bounds we instinctively think it's it's our ball you, you, like and we're not optimizing for or the first thing that comes to mind isn't like hey is whose ball is it it's it's our ball <laughs> and so to your point about illusions it seems like a lot of life is, is like that that there's um you know just benefits of self-deluding yourself when you're trying to sell something or pitch someone on something like the more you believe it, the more compelling you are going to be. And so there seems to be some practical benefit to self-delusion. I'm, I'm curious how, how you reconcile that or think about that. Yeah, so I think that's true, but only if you allow that the benefit itself could be a delusion. <laughs> <That is laughs> like the thought that, look, obviously it's just better for me to get the ball, or obviously it's just better for me to sell this product to that person. That's you want to do that thinking pretty fast and not look at it too long. Right. Cause like, maybe it's not, um, um, that is maybe selling this thing to this person isn't actually as important as you've told yourself on the basis of very little reasoning that it is. And as you've maintained, because you're like, look, I just need to get to the next 15 minutes. And so I need to just hold that fix for the next 15 minutes. A part of, part of our thinking that is really fixed is the thinking about benefits, right? We don't think very reflectively about benefits. And a lot of times we come to periods in our lives when 
Okay, great example um, that I talk about in um, the book I'm writing right now is Tolstoy wrote this book called A Confession, where he had this like midlife crisis in saying, do I have anything of value in my life? Does my life have any meaning at all? He was constantly on the verge of suicide. He would have to do things like hide like ropes so that he didn't like hang himself. And when he went out into this field, he wouldn't take his gun, so he wouldn't shoot himself. And so he was just totally depressed and feeling like nothing in his life had any value. Okay. This is after he has written war and peace. He has a giant manor. He's rich. He's an aristocrat. He has a family, he has a wife, he has a bunch of kids. He has the respect of like all of Russia. He is a kind of idol and hero. He has everything you could possibly want in life. He's just like, yeah, but what's the point of any of it? Because what he finds is that he never really spent any time thinking of whether he was really benefiting himself by writing a novel or having a successful property or having kids, etc. And so all those benefits that you think you can get by deluding yourself, they're themselves part of the delusion system. That's fascinating. You, you you mentioned you're you're writing a book right now. Is this the the one on love and marriage, or is it a different book? No, that's gonna be my next book. This one's on Socrates. Okay. What what are you hoping that people uh, take from the book? For uh, and the people being people who are very familiar with Socrates, like what do you think is most understood about about Socrates, or where are you looking to correct the record, so to speak, or or introduce a new way of looking at Socrates? A lot of ways, but I guess here are two that spring to mind. So first, I don't think that Socrates is ironic. Um, That is, I think he's basically just saying what he actually thinks, even when, even in the parts that seem sort of crazy and that those parts can be made good sense of and that it's something like Socratic irony is like a defense mechanism that readers have used to convince themselves that Socrates didn't actually produce good arguments to turn our lives upside down. There's literally that phrase in the Gurgis where Calicles is like, if he is serious, then our lives should be turned upside down. Could he possibly be serious? So that's one. And then the other is, I think, just the, the Socrates' most important insight, which is pretty simple, but I, I don't think it has been so well appreciated as his most important insight, which is that there are certain things that you can't think about by yourself. That is that some of the most important kinds of thinking have to take the form of talking. That the thing you're trying to think about has like two sides and talking allows you to see both sides because the other person's helping you see the other side. And you have to see both sides at the same time in order to see the very thing. And so Socrates was interested in those questions and the questions that could only be pursued by more than one mind. Going back earlier for the benefits of conceptual literacy, would we say that the benefits, like conceptual literacy may not make that Oakland A's baseball player a better baseball player, but it will give him something of value that is bigger than baseball <laughs> that he could do for eternity? Or like, what's the way to to sort of think about the benefits of conceptual literacy? The the Oaklandese baseball player, like, let's let's say, I, I don't know what the actual case is of what he was supposed to be told, but maybe it was certain kinds of attention to the way that he's swinging the bat or something. There, it just may well be that there is no interesting question to which that is an answer. And so whether you know it or not is kind of incidental. That would be Socrates' reason for not looking into it, not because it would harm his swing. What conceptual literacy should give you is a sense that you're not going through life on autopilot, being kind of commandeered by the two sources we have to answers to questions about what should I do. There's just, I think there's just two of them, according to Socrates, if you don't do philosophy, one is your body. So Um, which is just your basic biological needs, your health, but then also wealth, because that helps you fulfill your bodily needs. That's one. Number two is other people. Um, So it's conformity, belonging to a group, status, et cetera. And um, everything you do is just you're unthinkingly automatically obeying one of those two commands. And people often think of themselves as free thinkers and as rebels because they ignore one of the commands, but then they're just ever more slavishly responsive to the other. And so that's what you're giving the Oakland A's player or anyone else who has conceptual literacy is liberation from enslavement to their bodies and the groups that they belong to. Well said. You mentioned that in your view, Socrates is is not uh, ironic in the way that some people think he is. Dave Foster Wallace, a few decades ago, famously wrote about how our culture has become drenched in in irony. And it's kind of a, I don't know if he said a defense mechanism against seriousness, but that we, we become w- way too ironic. And this was before social media and the internet and things became much more ironic from there. I, 
from my limited interactions with you and see you, you seem to be a very serious person and I haven't seen you use it, a ton of irony. Do you agree with that self-assessment and what do you think about irony uh, today in, in this culture? Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, irony, that word is, it's just the same word in ancient Greek, ironia, um, and it's literally shows up in the dialogues. Like people like Callicles are like, hey, Socrates, you ha you're Aaron, you have Aaronia, you're ironic, right? And Socrates denies it. And, it, you know, at the time, the word really meant something like decept deceptive, de uh, deceptively withholding stuff. Like, come on, we know you have the answers. You're just pretending not to have the answer. The Rosemichus says, right? It's not the it's not the cooperative interlocutors who accuse Socrates of this. It's the people who are clearly like the bad guys. For some case, Calcles, Alcibiades, the Socrates imagines the people and the jurors in the audience who are against him. He's like, if I if I explain the way it is, you're all going to say I'm being ironic. Okay. Which is to say, yes, unserious, but more specifically, deceptively withholding. And so what happens is the, to the reception of Socrates over time, people, of course, eventually are consuming basically Plato's Socrates or Xenophon Socrates. There were other Socratic dialogues, but they didn't get preserved. I mean, they did get preserved for a little while and then they didn't anymore. But you get um, people like Cicero and Quintilian um, praising the uh Irony, the irony of Socrates, and they find it delightful and urbane and sophisticated, and it becomes this virtue of Socrates. So, the, so this this Socratic irony that so annoyed Callicles and Thrasymachus is actually um, it's considered a rhetorical kind of power to be ironic, right? So it graduates to a kind of a virtue, an ability to control your speech in a certain way. The, the greatest Socrates interpreter of all time, I think I can say that, like a, a, a classicist, you know, ancient philosophy people would agree, Gregory Vlastos, he actually claims that Socratic irony is Socrates' greatest cultural contribution. Um, cultural, not philosophical, but still it's very striking, right? So that in some sense, like we got irony from Socrates, or rather we got irony as a good thing, right? Now, I think all that's based on a mistake. Um, and I think Plato thinks it's based on a mistake. That's why he puts it in the mouths of all the enemies of Socrates, right? But so irony is this very complicated thing where on the one hand, when you're on the receiving end of it, you're a bit irritated. If the person's talking to you, they seem to be withholding. On the other hand, if you're a third party, and you're watching the interaction, say I'm being ironic to you and then we have listeners, right? They kind of enjoy it. The listeners kind of enjoy it. Why? Because they think I'm just withholding from you, not from them, right? Because they think they can tell what the hidden meaning is or whatever. They're smart enough to see through it. So irony makes an, an observing audience feel smart and feel like something was reserved for them, something that was hidden from Thrasymachus and Callicles, but was just for the audience. Okay. So I think that's the sort of dynamic of irony and that if I'm, in effect, if I'm too direct with you, then there's nothing special that the audience is getting. So I think if you have a lot of spectated conversations, you're going to get either a lot of irony or a lot of perception of irony or enough anticipation of the perception of irony that it creates irony. <laughs> um, and um, that is what we have, on, at least on some forms of social media, like on Twitter. And so it makes sense to me that, yes, that you end up with a lot of irony. I agree. Also, irony to me seems like a, in some cases to be kind of like a subversive tactic, like a way to punch up or perceived punch up. And in our culture, status is often unclear and, and, and very mobile and people don't know where they fit. And so they have anxiety around it. And so being able to punch up is a way, is an accepted way to maybe elevate your own status there seems to be something there, like cultures that have more rigid status hierarchies probably have less irony, I, I could imagine. Yeah. And I guess there's some overlap between irony and making fun of people. Maybe a lot of irony is making fun of people and maybe a lot of making fun of people is irony. But more generally, I just think we have a, we have a lot of making fun of people. <laughs> um, and yeah, maybe you're right that that's going to happen in a world where there's some status fluidity, but also just a world where there's a lot of possibility of people watching your interactions with other people. 
Um, so you would behave very differently if the, if there were no spectators. Yeah. And in a world where it's so easy to remix everything, um, and like, um, we've all, we all have these cultural shared memes basically. So it's easy to reference and reference references and know what people are talking about and make all these comparisons. So there's so much kind of artillery for, for our irony. Is, is status a game where the more you, you think about it, you lose <laughs> the, the more you, you understand the, like the, the, or everything, anything done for express purpose of increasing one status is unlikely to increase your status or. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things like that. In fact, not just status, um, like apology is like that. Like when I apologize to you, if my apology is too directly driven by my desire for you to forgive me and it's too transparent, it won't work. Right. So there are a lot of intentions that have to erase their own foot tracks or something. That's just like a thing. I'm just amazed by how even people who think a lot about status and it might be very perceptive about it, engage in the same status seeking behaviors in totally unreflective ways. And I'm sure I do it too. So that it's like the parts of our brain that govern our status climbing, uh, they're off, they're, they're off doing that, like, regardless of how we're theorizing. And so we're not, we're not super able to control that or to the extent that we do, it becomes very legible to other people in ways that then undermine your status. Um, that is, there's a lot of stuff where we're much better at reading other people than we are at faking out other people. And, and, and as going back to Donald Hoffman's book, Case Against Reality, he says we're, we're pretty good at, um, I guess, faking out ourselves or the people who the, people, the best people who are able to fake out other people truly fake out themselves, which gives them the ability to fake out other people. Right. I think that convincing yourself of something is going to make you the most persuasive liar about it. Yeah. George Costanza once said, it's, it's not a lie if you believe it. Uh, <laughs> right. This Seinfeld character. I think that's true, by the way. Like, I think you're still saying something false, but you're not, you can't be saying it with an intent to deceive if you think it's true. Right. Going back to Socrates for a second, my very cursory, you know, simplification or crude simplification of of Strauss, of Leo Strauss, um, or one of his ideas was that there's this deep tension between uh, sort of the world of philosophy and the world of of politics. And we kind of need to shield both from each other in the sense that, uh, you know, you shield philosophy from politics because we don't want more geniuses like Socrates being... Uh, you know, put to death and you shield politics from philosophy because, you know, politics requires, you know, compromise and it requires half truths in order to motivate, you know, nations of people. And so, and most people can't handle the complexities of life that come with philosophy. So what I'm curious, feel free to edit that characterization if, if I'm, if it's missing something cr critical, but two, I'm, I'm curious, you know, people say sometimes that Tyler Cowen is a uh, Straussian. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's, uh, if, if, if that's true, it, it kind of resonates with me, but you know, hard to truly know what, what one is uh, really thinking. Me and my peers often ask ourselves, how Straussian should we be? You know, should, should we be, uh, to the extent that I define Strauss correctly, like, should we be saying what we really think? You know, obviously you're a philosopher, so my sense is you say what you think uh, uh, often, but yeah, what do you think about that? I did an event with Tyler um, at the University of Chicago at, on politics, sorry, philosophy versus economics. And after that event, like, a, you know, I always talk to students after the event, they come to my office, or whatever. And I asked them like what they thought of the event. And he's like, they're, they basically, this was the like consensus from the students I talked to was something like, he was a lot smarter and more impressive than you, but you're a lot more sincere. <laughs> um, and I thought that was a good sort of summary <laughs> And uh, I think of being Straussian as in a way not being very sincere, um, but not in a way where you're lying um, exactly, but almost in a way where even you aren't really sure what you think. Um, that is the really convincing liar convinces themselves, right? And so there's a certain kind of, you get, I suppose you develop a talent, a certain kind of facility for saying the right thing under the right circumstances where you yourself believe it in a way in the to the to the extent that you're not lying right 
And uh, I think that's the sort of scale or ability that Tyler was demonstrating and the students were very impressed by it, but they also found it to be in a certain way and sincere, right? Okay, so um, now I, I suppose that that skill probably is good at not getting you killed or something. So I disagree with Strauss about some things. Um, I respect him a lot as a as a reader. He's um, he's a very rich reader. Like you read his just his close readings of texts, and you see all these things you didn't see before. But like this thought about, uh, I'll just sort of accept your formulation, which I think is sort of fair enough. Um, you know, keeping politics and philosophy apart from each other. Like, there's a question: who separates them? Is it the is it the politicians? Is it the philosophers? Which one are we? Are we somehow standing above this whole thing at some position where we can perfectly see the virtues and vices of both? And we don't, and these two groups have these blind spots, but we don't have them. And that character often shows up in Strauss of the idea of like, well, most people can't see or appreciate something, but like, luckily I don't have any of the problems I'm diagnosing. I mean, that's just what it is to not have diagnosed the really deep problems. It's like if you say most people can't handle the complexity of life, but I can, that means I haven't found the real complexities. Those are the ones I can't handle. I think like a real philosopher is looking for those complexities, the ones they themselves can't handle, not the ones they can just call out other people for not being able to handle. So I guess I think sincerity is like the only tool we have when it comes to those things. When there's questions you actually want to know the answers to, um, there's just there's just nothing else at your disposal but sincerity. Uh, and there's a kind of desperation you have when there are questions you want to know the answers to. Like, um, so the thought, oh, how Straussian should we be? That's from the point of view of somebody who, uh, that's point from the point of view of a wealthy person or something. He's <laughs> yeah. like, well, I could say this or I could say this. Either way, I'll be fine, right? But suppose you're like desperate to know certain things and not, literally nothing else matters to you. Then there's no question arising about how Straussian or how like how sincere should I be? Just be totally sincere all the time because maybe this is the cha- maybe this is your chance to learn something from someone, and so like maybe there's a question like Socrates fundamentally was out to learn things from people. He wasn't out to impress them, and because like if I impress you, you know, that's great for you. You got something out of it, but what did I get out of impressing you? That's just my reputation's like in you. It's not in me. I didn't learn anything, right? Um, so there's a weird way in which the person who's impressing other people is kind of altruistic. They're thinking about what's in the minds of those other people. And the Socratic is much more selfish. And it's like, I want to know stuff. And sincerity is my only way to do that. And I think that, you know, the moral of the Socratic story for Plato was not like, oh, no, a genius like Socrates got killed. The moral of the story, which is very, there's so many dialogues about the death of Socrates, and they all say the same thing. It was not a bad thing for Socrates. Socrates was not harmed. It was fine for Socrates. It was bad for Athens. Athens was committing an injustice. And an injustice is like an injury to your soul. And that's what was happening to all those jurors. And that was terrible. And Athens, you know, that was a bad thing. But it wasn't bad for Socrates. And the other part is Socrates wasn't a genius. That is, at least Plato really tries to depict him as lacking what would be the markers for impressiveness in the world that he was in. So like the Tyler Cowens of Socrates' world would be people who had good memories. Okay, so they would be remarkable. I mean, that was like a thing in the ancient world where you can't really record stuff. Just being able to remember a lot of stuff is uh, basically that's code for intelligence. Right. And Socrates, in many, many places, he's like talks about how he has a bad memory. And the number two for impressing people is being able to talk in sophisticated ways. So like how you talk in a law court um, and Socrates in a number of places, including in the law court, says, I can't do that fancy talk that other people do. I'm just going to say the words, the same words as they come into my head in that same order, right? Non-Straussian. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's in a way Plato trying to say there was nothing else that was special about Socrates. He wasn't some super smart guy. He wasn't a genius. He wasn't impressive. He was just somebody who wanted to know the answer to certain questions. And he put that in front of everything else. So would you agree then that Tyler is Straussian. Uh, it's funny because, you know, Tyler, I, I think, is one of the great thinkers of, of our era in, in some ways. And and yet when I hear uh, people like Brian Kaplan or your co-host, Robin, Robin Hansen, t- talk about Tyler, they obviously have worked with Tyler and love Tyler, but they will also be somewhat critical in this way of, oh, he's kind of hedging or not willing to say exactly what he thinks or put stands in the ground. So I'm curious if if you resonate with that assessment. I think he is saying what he thinks. Um, I think his thinking is very flexible. 
And, but I told Tyler that, I mean, this about the responses of the students, I told all this to Tyler, so this won't be news to him. There are a lot of different niches for public intellectuals, right? A lot of different roles that a public intellectual can have. And Tyler's like uniquely well-suited to his peculiar role, which is a very altruistic one. It's really about benefiting other people. And it's not about inquiring into the truth or learning anything. But it's great for the world that such altruistic people exist. You wouldn't say his Marginal Revolution blog is about kind of un- better understanding the world and trying to, or, or his books about don't take stances or try to present ideas or worldviews? There were some blog posts he once had where he said he could almost say that every one of his blog posts is who should be ra- raised in status and who should be lowered. <laughs> and like, I, I think that he's trying to make the world a better place. And that's what the the, the heading says, of right? And um, he's trying to think who is underrated and should be boosted a little bit more and um, which worries should be downplayed and which should be upplayed. And uh, that's like, that's fundamentally the sort of business that he's in. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. Going back to Socrates, you, you wrote a blog post about Socrates and um, sort of politics. And I want to quote you here. You say, Socrates wouldn't respect the point of view of the protesters outside his window. He would want to know who is right and who is wrong, and he wouldn't stop talking to them until the difference between points of view was obliterated. Persuade or be persuaded. And so I'm, I'm curious, why aren't you publicly invested in the biggest culture war issues of our time and uh, taking, you know, finding out what's right and presenting your findings? How do you respond to that? Oh, I think I am invested in them. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to figure out what's right and presenting my findings. That was one instance of it. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, I, I think I might have, like, I think that uh, I guess I see free speech as the biggest, is the, if I had to pick number one, biggest culture war issue of our time. And I've written a number of things on it, including that piece. Probably that's the topic I've written the most about. Often when people summarize me, at least recently, they've been like, most of her, most of her writing is about like romance and relationships. <laughs> and it's like, I've written maybe two or three things on that. And most of it's actually been on free speech. What is free speech? And I think that we really don't know what it is. And the people who are stamping their feet about it, least of all, and we don't, we, a certain conception of free speech, which is just kind of like, leave people alone and let them say what they want, has worn out. Like, it's like worn out, it's welcome. And now we, um, we don't know what to do. And I mean, I think it's the million conception of free speech. Like, I, I'm a fan of Mill, but I, um, I think the thought that ideas are somehow duking it out in a notional marketplace of ideas doesn't make a lot of sense because the marketplace is not a place it's ideas are in people's heads and that abstraction is just kind of it worked for a while and it doesn't it doesn't work anymore no i should note the phrase marketplace of ideas is not in mill mill scholars will be angry at me but i think even though i read a paper on this by a mill scholar saying yeah and that's really significant i don't think it's really significant i think the idea is in mill even if the phrase isn't but i'll just acknowledge that (laughs) and um when you say worn out, it's welcome. Do you mean that people are now upset with it, or, or what does it mean? Like, why doesn't it apply anymore as well? You might study, uh, like, you might go to study a musical instrument, and you might have this idea, uh, a vague idea of what you're going to get, and then you never get anything more than that, and and you have this image of yourself, the violinist, or something, and you know you're playing the violin, and it kind of sucks, and you hate it, and you're bad at it. And, and that image of yourself being the great, it sort of wears out its welcome after a while because it was never meant to be the thing you ended up with. It was meant to be the thing you started with and it was meant to evolve and improve. And um, that's sort of what I think about male on free speech. It was meant to be the beginning of a process of thinking about what it would be to be in a community in which speech public speech achieved its proper ends. And, um, you know, step one in that, on that road, and of course, male's not step one, but still we can say step one would be something like don't ban heresy. Okay. That's really what Mill's thinking about. He's thinking about heretical, um, you know, people who seem to not be believing in God or even giving arguments that God doesn't exist. Right. Um, like he's like, don't, don't ban those. That's not how we're going to live in like, the ideal space of communication. That was a good thought. I think he was right about that. But 
that isn't the end all and be all of free speech. And I think that a certain kind of permissivism doesn't capture what we actually want. Like what, what are we listening for? And um, how can we learn from each other? Those to me are like deep questions about speech that just don't ban stuff doesn't really address. You had an episode with Robin Hansen on your great podcast together um, on free speech. And he talked about in his mind, it's, it's really the freedom to listen. Was that compelling to you? <laughs> no, I don't think Robin's right about that. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thought that to at least remember that <laughs> there are listeners, not just speakers. And that um, like the battle over who speaks is really like a battle between the elite over eliteness. Right. Um, it's like, who is, uh, who gets honored really? It's about like, who is publicly honored and, um, there's an and and so Robin is drawing attention to the fact that like most of the characters in this story are actually the listeners and not the speakers, and that you're listening, you know, there, there's a question, what kinds of information are listeners getting? And as a listener, what kind of information do you have a right to? So that's how he's thinking about it. And I think that that makes sense, but that ultimately that too has is still infected by the million thought because the thought is like, okay, I get in all the information, right? Let's say I got every, and now I have to figure things out. And then where is that going to happen? It, like, am I just supposed to figure that out inside my head? Am I, is the whole marketplace of ideas going to happen in my head now? And, and it somehow battles it out and I come to the right conclusion. No, that's what we were supposed to be doing outside, right? We were supposed to be having conversations. And so the idea that there's just a bunch of speakers and a bunch of listeners to me doesn't get at the real issue, which is like, how do exchanges work? Um, how do we listen to each other or argue with each other? Um, I think I tweeted, uh, I recently read this like Chesterton uh, essay. Uh, it was like a, maybe it was a book review or something, but anyway, it was th this little bit of it was, um, I mean, it was like everything he writes, just a big, big whiny complaint about how things are nowadays. Right? Um, but it was just people fight instead of arguing. He said people fight when they can't argue. And I think it's like free speech is arguing. That's what that's what free speech really is. And so we have to figure out not how to listen or how to talk, but how to argue. To me, uh, uh, so free speech is certainly a massive one. Another massive one that maybe is even upstream of that is, is in terms of like philosophical problem that relates to everyday life in all sorts of different ways and you've um you've written about this as well is sort of how do you justify hierarchy or partiality or variance uh, you, you've written about it in the context of how do you reconcile sort of egalitarianism meritocracy or, or the bottom you know and having natural or inherent uh, kind of honor just you know points for just for being alive with sort of the idea that people should earn things um, and strive for more, you, you'd probably put it much better than, than I just did. Um, and that sort of question around your know, hierarchy, partiality, variance, your, your disparities between people, between groups of people, is there a justification? What is that justification? Because the idea of egalitarianism or equality is just so deeply rooted in our culture, such that you know, um, Mark Andreessen famous once said, "Like software is eating the world." It seems like you know much further back than that. Like equality is eating the world. We're we're just continuously introducing more and more forms of equality, and and sometimes that is uh, you know empowering, and sometimes that is uh, uh, messes with uh, sort of the the order or destabilizing, I guess to say the least. So I remember earlier where I said like there are these two basic commands that autonomous that dictate how we live our lives. One of them is body, our bodies, and the other is kinship groups. So equality comes out of that. That is, it is the principle of just about every kinship group that at some level or in some way, everyone in the group is equal or has an equal claim on something. Um, and this can be, you know, brothers or sisters in a household. It can be, um, um, fellow citizens in a city who each, like, let's say in Aristotle's um, city, each have a claim to rule. So this kind of equality, first of all, is always artificial in the sense that, like, there's no sense in which a, the siblings are equal. They're not, like, inherently equal. The equality is a function of the group. It's the group dictates that everyone in it is equal. And that that's part of what it is for the group to be a group. Now, 
these equalities always the the sort of there's a sort of default, but then there there are some hierarchies that are always justified, right? And so there might be like the firstborn child or the male child or whatever is going to be hierarchically above the other. So it's it's certainly just as much as equality, so is hierarchy a principle of kinship. And the kind of struggles in kinship groups are often these attempts to balance equality and hierarchy. You know, maybe maybe we're gravitating towards forms of kinship that are very um, equality centric. I guess my thought would be my my sort of like underlying thought about that would be sort of similar to what do I think about the fact that we like indulge in a lot of luxuries like in terms of answering um our like the bodily the body set of commands which is kinship groups group membership is not a great source of answers to questions as to how you should live it is one of our defaults that we have that we get for free without thinking so that's useful to us just like our bodies are but um this is to say i don't think egalitarianism is any kind of fundamental truth about the way the world is I don't think there's any sense in which people are fundamentally equal that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fiction of a group. But I also think like there's no fundamental sense in which we have to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. That's just like what our bodies tell us. Um, That's not like, that doesn't tell us like when it's good to do the thing or when it's bad to do the thing. I think there are certain like hard won philosophical truths, which is like, like every human being has a certain kind of dignity, but that's to say that each one isn't, incomparable to any other which is not at all the same idea as equality so this is something where i like i've come into a lot of like you know i'll I'll write something about it at some point a lot of incredulity because a lot of people think of equality as some kind of a moral principle but i don't think it's a moral principle i think it's a principle that groups employ to get along and it's always balanced against hierarchy it's always like which hierarchies are justified exceptions to equality what are the implications of that shift in thinking? Like, um, if you don't think of it as a moral principle and you steady think of it as a kind of group group adaptation, do you have better, more sympathy for, for, for or more understanding as to why it continues to emerge or what, why is it important to have that shift? Well, one thing is like, if some scenario makes things less equal, that doesn't, for me, make it worse, because I don't think it's a fundamental moral principle. If that scenario involves um, treating people disrespectfully or not respecting their dignity, then that's bad, because I I believe that moral principle. Um, So that's important, because it's important to know whether, whether you're tracking what people think matters, or whether you're tracking what actually matters. So I think equality is a thing that people think matters, but I don't think it per se, it matters at all. I think sometimes it like correlates with something else that matters. Uh, For example, I think often egregious forms of inequality just like make it hard for people to have conversations. Now I think having conversations is super important. So if we need a bunch of equality for the sake of conversations, let's, let's bring on that equality, but, but not because it would somehow otherwise be intrinsically bad not to have it. Some people have a broader sense of morality that kind of follows, uh, I'm trying to think like almost like a Darwinian morality, like whatever, like evolves to the next generation, like or passes on to the next generation is what's right. Um, and uh, some people say, hey, you shouldn't mess too much with this idea of kind of, you know, what has worked and what has passed on and what will, what is most likely to continue to pass on. But then some other people say, well, it's also Darwinian to like mess with that cycle to begin with, like um, to some degree. And so we, we, we can change that nature or change that um, to make it more likely such that this thing that seems in some abstract way more fair to to pass on. I'm curious if that thinking brings up anything for you. In judging like what works, we're making a moral judgment. And uh, it's not always true that the people with the right answers are the ones who survive. Uh, So I think you can't read morality off of survival in that direct way. When like a serious and concerted effort to um, try to figure something out. I, I'm an optimist about that. I think it tends to uh, it tends to move in the right direction over, you know, at the time scale of hundreds or thousands of years. I think we should be optimistic about our progress. Um, we should be optimistic, for example, that let's say 
some versions of the moral intuitions that we have, say, against slavery, um, in favor of children's uh, having a role in their own self-determination, in favor of sort of exposure to a variety of like forms of culture, or whatever, like that some version of that, we should be sort of optimistic that it's going to succeed. But I think we also need to be humble in the light of the fact that the future, uh, like the that very fact, the future will be wiser than us. And so they're going to know that we were wrong about some things. Uh, so we shouldn't want to pass down too many of our ideas to them. We should only want to pass down the correct ones. So I guess, but to me, that's not really an evolutionary. The point that um, figuring things out tends in the direction of trying to figure things out tends in the direction of figuring them out. That's not an evolutionary point, I think. That's like a point about the faith and inquiry, but just about anyone who's ever having a conversation has got to be committed to that. Otherwise, what is the point of the conversation? Unless they're trying to persuade, but without truly inquiring, but then it would, we're back at our question about self-delusion. Um, it's, it seems that one challenge that many people have is, is differentiating between sort of the idea that someone has equal moral worth and yet that they would have difference in outcomes or, or, or status or other things if they have equal moral worth. That, that feels difficult, a difficult sort of thing to reconcile or to intuitively understand for, for, for many people. I, so I think that this is something where I definitely need to think more about it and my own, I'll say why my, my own initial responses are not very intelligent, I think, because I actually just happen to viscerally not get this very well. So, uh, and I think that it's connected to what I call the dark empathy problem. So like we live in a world where people think empathy is really awesome and they think it's really good to be able to sort of channel and feel other people's pain. The, the thing is that empathy doesn't determine how you're going to respond to feeling someone else's pain, right? So like, say I can feel your pain as though it were happening to me, then I could either, I could be sad about that on my own behalf, right? Or I could be happy about it. Um, that's dark empathy. And I think empathy doesn't, dictate whether it's going to go in the nice or the dark direction. And people tend to assume it's going to go in the nice direction, but I think it lots of times it goes in the dark direction. Okay. And so like, I think that the empathetic people feel on behalf of those who are suffering, they feel the good kind of empathy, but then they also feel dark empathy on behalf of those who are thriving a joy in the prospect of those people's pain, envy, etc. So the empathetic people are also the ones. So it's like, uh, I, I see this because I have children and some of my children are empathetic and others of my children are not empathetic. And I see that the, 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 the good and the bad side of empathy go together. Um, and so because I'm, I'm not very empathetic. And so I find it odd that, um, uh, somebody would be unhappy with the fact that someone else is doing well, but it's mostly like, cause I'm like, why would you care in the same way that I'm like, why would you care if someone else is doing badly? Why would you care about any of it? Um, but it's, you would care if you had empathy, right? So if you had empathy, you would care that the people were suffering and you would care that the other people were thriving and you would feel outraged about the one and sad about the other. And I just like, don't have any of these feelings. And so I'm having to like decode them from some distance that makes my responses somewhat unintelligent. So I'm still like processing, I guess I think that um, um, what that what we have to do is hit some kind of foundation where we have some thought about like like what is the community for, and then what is it like like to what extent does the community have to be a community, right? What does it get? What does it have to do together, and then um, what do we need for that? And Maybe we need like lots of material equality to have what we want our community for. Say we say say the purpose of our community is conversation. I think that's a pretty good purpose for a community. And say like people just as a psychological fact really have a lot of trouble having conversations across like giant wealth gradients or something. Um, then maybe we need lots of material equality. But like say they don't, then then maybe the people who are worried about that just just need to be educated that that thing wasn't actually very important. So I think you can't use empathy as a guide because of dark empathy. 
Um, and we need something else as our guide. And that something else is going to be, what does it take for a community to function? But that question is, we can only answer that question when we know what is the function? What are we trying to do with our community? And I have an answer to that question, but I'm not sure what that answer entails about, say, material conditions. Have you said the answer or what is the answer? I think it's to figure things out. <laughs> Philosophy, basically. That is, I think we don't know the answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? What are we supposed to do? Why are we here? We don't know the answers to those questions. We go through our lives acting like we know the answers, but we're really just parroting answers that we get from other people or from our bodies. And we can't figure the answers out on our own because I'm a Socratic. I just think literally cannot think about it by yourself. You can do a thing you call thinking about it. That's actually just you rehearsing some things other people said. And you really could think about it if you would talk to other people about it. But there's lots of reasons you don't talk to other people. Uh, and it's because basically the groups that we're part of, our kinship groups, are not structured to facilitate conversation. That's what I would call the problem of free speech. And uh, maybe part of the problem there is inequality. I'm open to that thought. And then we need equality. Uh, so that's where equality would figure in my bigger picture understanding of like, uh, you know, communal life. Your, your answer reminded me of when I first read Paul Bloom's book Against Empathy. It was the first time that I considered that empathy is not only a positive thing. The term empathy is such amazing branding, uh, where someone who, who doesn't have empathy is seen as almost a monster by some people. Um, and we all, the answer to everything just seems we need to have more empathy. <laughs> and yet, uh, Paul, and we, we kind of just alluded to the places where empathy leads us astray. Yeah, I mean, empathy is a skill, as I see it. And skills can, um, skills do not teach you how to use those very skills. So skill, like memory is a skill. <laughs> Speaking well is a skill. In general, it's good to have skills, but someone who has a skill isn't necessarily going to use it well. And so you shouldn't conflate the skill with the right use of the skill. That's what we've done with empathy. That, that, that's well said. The um, kind of closing the loop on on some things we brought up earlier some people, there's this term out there that is used to describe the idea of just thinking for thinking's sake. I think it's it's certainly a crude term, definitionally, uh, but it's also, I think, crude, or I think it's certainly inaccurate. They call it intellectual masturbation. Do you think that term is like, there's any valid use of that term? Or is that term just like a misunderstanding of what thinking is for? Like, or, or just mis misunderstands the, that, mis underappreciates that thinking for its own sake? Is, is value. I'm curious how, how you, you've heard that term before, I'm sure. What do you think about it? I have heard it before. I've never really reflected on it. But now that I do, I'm almost tempted to say it, it sounds like a description of what Aristotle thinks God does. So Aristotle's God, the prime mover, is thought thinking itself. So it, God thinks about God, but God is thought thinking, the thought of God thinking itself. <laughs> I mean, if that's not intellectual masturbation, I don't know what is, right? And Aristotle just thought, well, what else are you going to have there at the very top of your being pyramid, right? And it's the, you know, Aristotle's God is the linchpin of the metaphysics and linchpin of the physics, right? So it's causally holding the whole universe together and, and, and metaphysically holding all of being together. All the things that exist, they're kind of, they're beings in us, uh, in a qualified sense. I mean, the real being, the real thing that is, is this immaterial thing, this thing that can't change. It's not, it doesn't have the defects of being material or can change. And it's just a thought that is sort of filled up. It's saturated with activity and the activity is thought itself. You know, who are we to judge? I mean, <laughs> if this is God, right? Um, so, uh, but, but like the, I, so I, so I think it, maybe that it, that thing has it, has its place. I think it would just be inappropriate for beings like us to do that because we don't already know the answer. So what are we going to think about? We're supposed to be thinking about problems to try to come to the ans get answers to questions. And so we are not supposed to think for its own sake. We're supposed to think in order to get answers. Maybe at the end of the story, once we've got all the answers, we can do the God thing and do intellectual masturbation and it'll be great. But <laughs> we're not there yet. Seamless uh, segue. In, I want to talk about love and marriage. Um, your, uh, you mentioned that that's your next book. You, you most recently had this um, New Yorker profile or New Yorker piece uh, that was uh, written about your perspective on the issues as well as some of your, your background. And I'll uh, broadly summarize, which is to say that you evaluated 
well, you're a public philosopher, not just in your thinking, but also in your practice of, of, of living life and living philosophically. And you, you know, you don't just do things because that's, they've been done before you, you know, evaluate them for first principles. And, and some of the things that you did from first principles were this idea of, Hey, it's this thought that typically when someone divorces someone that they, that they can't be good friends or something, or yeah, that's like a stereotype that people have, or let alone that they might be good friends with their, um, you know, with your future partner. Uh, and it's actually interesting because I, I grew up in a house, my, my parents were divorced before they had me. So I have a half sister and my parents are friends with my sister's new parents. Um, so kind of a similar situation as you described um, for, for yourself. And people would comment on how strange that was. So I, I'm, I'm used to this idea that this is, uh, that this is a strange idea. Anyways, I, I say this to one, give background, but two, to ask you to share a little bit with, with us about what you hope people take from, from the, the book that you haven't yet written, or more broadly, like, do you, do you want more people to live philosophically in, in this way as well? I, I think the, the charitable take is, Hey, uh, any progress comes from, you know, reevaluating cer certain things and experimenting with certain things and, you know, um, discovering what makes sense for each individual i mean I'm, to, to that extent i'm curious how much do you think you know how if you're prescribing at all um but then two i think a, a cynical take might be on sort of living philosophically hey can i just justify kind of anything i want to do by using philosophy or fancy words to justify sort of you know instincts which sometimes maybe is the right thing to do maybe sometimes might not be the right, right thing to do i i'm really trying not to prescribe I try, I try pretty hard. I don't always succeed in not prescribing in anything that I write. And I find it overwhelming how much public writing is um, advice or we need to, we must, um, the time has come for. And um, I think that's part of the free speech problem as I understand it, which is that where you only know how to yell at each other and how to be extremely sure that everyone else ought to think the thing that you think, which is probably wrong, right? Um, so so like inquisitive speech is, you know, as my uh, kids' teachers would say, still an emerging skill for humanity. And I'm trying to speak in that way and to live in that way as well, which is to say, you know, I'm, I'm trying something out. That's what life is. It could be wrong. But like, you know, someone else who like everyone's life is an experiment and everyone could be wrong. And the fact that your life looks a lot like the lives of the people around you doesn't really make it more likely to be right. So that's a kind of terrifying truth about life that we're all experimenting, whether or not that's obvious. You know, I, I, I wouldn't say that I had very articulate thoughts about what people, what I wanted people to take away from the profile. I mean, I didn't write the profile, so I didn't like have aims in writing it. But I was pleased by how many people wrote to me and said things like, like the reaction to the profile, like say on Twitter, or whatever was very negative. But I got a lot of people writing to me being like, oh, I had like a real conversation with my spouse for the first time in a long time about your piece. Or like, oh, I can't stop talking about this. Like lots of people talk to their spouses about this. That was like a, a like a real effect of this piece was that it started conversations and also to their friends. Those people, some of them then came and talked to me. It made them feel like these topics could be talked about. And I think that's what it is to speak inquisitively. It's to like open the topic as something that the reader has a co contribution to make. And, you know, if I come across as somebody who doesn't look like they have all the answers, all the better for that effect, right? Because in fact, I don't. So that's truthful. And, you know, trying to make myself... I, I do think a lot of public intellectuals want to put forward a face of at least maximally looking like they have answers to the degree that they can, but that tends to close off conversation, not to encourage it, right? So that's the sense in which self-exposure is really beneficial to you, like me, if what you want is not, it's like to hear back from other people and to um, also for them to make progress in the conversation to, you know, to the extent that you haven't. Um, so, um, you know, can't you just justify anything you want to do? Like, I think the answer is yes, but you can do that anyway, with or without philosophy, you can do it with convention, you can do it with, um, impulse or the bodily desires, right? So your body and the people around you give you resources for justifying things. And the difference with doing it philosophically is that you have to form a conversational agreements with other people who then have to see it your way. And so like, 
I didn't just do all this myself, right? I had to have a lot of conversations with not just my husband, my ex-husband, but, you know, my kids and my friends and to explain myself, to come up with agreements, to modify those agreements as time went on. And very little, if any of this was done with a view to getting people in the outside world to think it was okay. Almost all of this happened well before I was anything like a public philosopher. Um, uh, it was with a view to figuring out what would actually be okay. But in fact, that's the best way to produce justifications, right? Uh, it's similar to the point we were discussing earlier about, um, you know, trying to trick other people is that like, uh, if I want to make what I do seem justified to other people, the best route is for me to actually think that it's justified. So I I'll can only do that to the best of my ability and the, to the best of the ability of the people around me, right? Because they're helping me do that. Uh, so of course I can be wrong, but I do think you have a better chance of being right if you actually try than if you don't try. So That's fascinating. What are you hoping to achieve or get through with your the book when, when you set out to write it that you haven't yet with that profile or other pieces you've written? I think that there's just a lot I want to know. And that's why I think that's why most people write books is that they want to know stuff. What, what are the things that you want to find, know or find out? I want to know, like, what is marriage? Um, and uh, like, there's some and what is sex? So I'm really interested in, you know, there's been a lot of writing on sex, but very little of it actually answers the question of what it is and why is it important to us? I'm thinking about that right now because I'm writing something for the Wall Street Journal on um, on sex. Um, and uh, but when I say what is marriage, I also mean like getting some of the heterogeneity in view, as I think there are really interesting differences, uh, different kinds of functions that marriage can play. And even within a single marriage, these can come to the fore. So I'm interested in understanding all of that and like the diff the. Difficulty is going to be kind of focusing uh, and, and, you know, having a narrow enough topic. Um, and then what is divorce and what, like, what, um, what kind of ideals should we have? Like we have ideals for marriage and I think we ought to have ideals for divorce too. And we don't. And so what should they look like? That those are some of the questions that I hope to have better answers to. Well, we will, uh, we will look forward to it in closing here. I've, uh, Something maybe it's a silly question, but did we just do philosophy this past uh, hour and a half? Like, <laughs> am I a, a street philosopher? And uh, that's my story. I tell myself in the sense of I don't have a lot of the body of knowledge, but I do ask, "Hey, are things true?" I do seek seek what is true and seek to seek to find out, and I'm able to somewhat separate between what is expected of me to to think and what is you know may, maybe actually true. Yeah. Um. So I think the answer is yes, but like the. The difficulty with doing philosophy on a podcast is just that you have to shift around a lot um, because we're also trying to entertain an audience of people who might get bored if we stayed on the same topic for too long. And so it's almost like we started to do philosophy on like a whole bunch of different topics <laughs> um, and then we quickly gave up. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good place to wrap the podcast, perhaps. Um, uh, Agnes, uh, this has been a delightful conversation. Thanks so much for for coming to the podcast. I highly recommend uh, for people who enjoyed this to uh, follow you on Twitter. Read your uh, you, you have links on your Twitter of your your columns, your your books, and uh, look forward to promoting your upcoming book on on Socrates. Thank you. Thanks so much. Upstream with Eric Tornberg is a show from Turpentine the podcast network behind Moment of Zen and Cognitive Revolution. If you like the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store.